<clears throat> Jesus said to his disciples, you have heard that it was said that eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, offer no resistance to one who is evil. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other one as well. Should anyone press you into service for one mile, go for two miles. Give to the one who asks of you, and do not turn your back on one who wants to borrow. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly Father, for he makes the sun rise on the bad and the good, and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what recompense will you have? Do not tax collectors do the same? And if you get, greet your brothers only, what is unusual about that? Do not pagans do the same? So be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus said to his disciples, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, offer no resistance to one who is evil. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other one as well. If anyone wants to go to law with you over your tunic, hand over your cloak as well. Should anyone press you into service for one mile, go for two miles. Give to the one who asks of you, and do not turn your back on one who wants to borrow. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly Father. For he makes his sun rise on the bad and the good, and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what recompense will you have? Do not tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what is unusual about that? Do not pagans do the same? So be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. When we had this passage in an earlier lesson, we all realized that we're all perfect, but. Uh... <laughs> and some people think an eye for an eye, okay, that's kind of an evil thing, but it doesn't stop the violence. It just continues and escalates it. <clears throat> and it's hard in situations through these readings, what would we do if, because of fear we might have in the process, but. You know, we were taught uh, we're not alone and uh, we're covered. Mm -hmm. It also, that reading uh, reminded me of what we've been reading in this lesson four here about the uh, golden rule mm -hmm. to do unto others, but even going uh, over and above that and trying to become perfect, even though that will never work out. But we got to keep striving towards that area, at least. Yeah. When we talk about being peace givers to finding the root of the problem and understanding, are we no better as sinners? That was interesting that uh, Jesus equated pagans and tax collectors. Hey. Put them in the same boat. But uh, I think he was going to a point across. Makes you think of all those people that are tax collectors and in those positions. Yeah. You know, what did they deal with? <laughs> you know, what a job. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> they are all the bad and the ugly and the mean. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a job. It's not who they are. Mm -hmm. So... And we all, that's a lot. If you want to live in society, you have to do your part. Uh, I have a, a challenge personally with 
that you love your enemy thing. That's, yeah, I can pray for them, but to love them, I mean, I was in the Marines. I spent a year in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You know, they were trying to kill us mm -hmm. and we were willing to kill them. And I could, I could understand that piece. The piece that I couldn't understand is the way they used children as weapons against people. I mean, they, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, the things that were done would be very difficult for me to see that I could love them as, as an equal. Uh, I could respect some of them because they were fighting for their homeland, they thought. Mm -hmm. you know, and we thought we were fighting for our allies. But the things that happened, um, of course, they happened on both sides, unfortunately. Oh. And you have some very good friends. I can't remember that. Okay. Mm -hmm. and those countries where they have people that are so strong and fight for their government that go as far as suicide bombers and things like that, too. It's like <clears throat> in their world or in yeah. their mind. They're doing right. Yeah. And well, it's just like, you know, when there's now they've even um, a mass shooting or something, and the parents say that they forgive them. And oh, that would be so hard to do. I don't. Mm -hmm. I it's don't amazing. Know. It is yeah, just amazing. I didn't know that I could. There would be. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of exactly that. That with this newest deal with that stabbing of that the two boys there at the Harding High School. I thought about that mother right away too. How would you forget that 16 year old for stabbing your child to death? We have to try somehow, but wow, that'd be difficult. Well, there, you know, there's a lot of different situations like that, even yeah. um, when someone did many things that were bad and they hurt, you know, my grandchildren or, and I know that that person was mentally ill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But still. Yeah. She knew what she was doing. It's very difficult, huh? It is. Yeah. It is. I, and it's really sad that other people that are around somebody like this 16-year-old boy, they had to know that he was a troubled kid. And I guess I'd probably been, I didn't listen to a real lot of it because I just got depressed listening to it too. Mm -hmm. But they've got to come forward and take care of those um, children, young adults, and preteens and everything that have those problems and not just talk about them and you know, mm -hmm. walk away from it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Whenever I hear this line, what you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy, I'm uh, reminded of my father-in-law who served in Guadalcanal in uh, World War II and grew up on a farm in northern Wisconsin and did a lot of hunting. So he shot a gun many times, but he said the first time that he looked through the sight of his army rifle at another human being to shoot him. He couldn't do it. He said, there's got to be a better way. And that's when he made the decision to oh. go into ministry. He became a Methodist minister. Oh, yeah. He says, I don't know that person. They don't know me. I've got nothing against them. They've got nothing against me. Yeah. Every time I uh, read that line. there a long time, or maybe before they've gotten that far, they've done so much um, wrong for many and they have asked for forgiveness and then they're, you know, they, they get they get spiritual help and, you know, but yeah, when it gets to the root of when it happens, it's, it's really hard, yeah. hard to understand. Every time I... <clears throat> Move into Can't the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. 
the um, opening prayer today was the one from Sunday where we talked about light and darkness. That's the uh, first part of the verses we're looking at today. Verses 22 and 23. Uh, talking about um, vision and uh, what we see in the second paragraph there on page 62. He isn't teaching science, but a spiritual truth concerning the kind of spiritual enlightenment that leads to righteousness. And that's what we talk about all the time when we're doing Bible study is it's we're not teaching science, we're not teaching history. Um, it's teaching religious truths and uh, how we relate to God and how we relate to one another. But then the bottom part there says, if the light that fills us is goodness, we'll be good and just people. If instead we are filled with darkness of moral corruption, how great will the darkness be? So this discussion here about light and darkness, what did you get out of that? We found it interesting in that it seemed obvious that seeing was something that happened inside oneself. And, um, and that little bit about the vision, um, and a lot of it is what we see and what we don't see to keep us in darkness most of the time. Um, really is hard to find the light sometimes though too like we were just talking about with all the things that are going on in the world you know and just getting so uh, mm -hmm. depressed about it that wouldn't it be nice if there was a whole newscast that was just good news but that doesn't sell or in the newspapers either you know i said that to my husband too and he said yeah that's not what people will buy though but there is one newscaster on at night it's on from 5 30 to 6 i can't think of his name right now but his last five minutes is always something good. So Bill watches the first uh, part of it. And then I say, let me know when that last five minutes. I want to hear something Skip good today. Yeah, right. I just want the last five minutes of good. But that's what we have to kind of strive to look for, too. There is a lot of good going on in the world. There's no doubt about that. But it's so tough to find it some days. Well, even when it's cloudy and overcast and rainy, I... It affects me a lot. Isn't it the truth? And when it's yeah. funny, it is truly a different day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's the light. and mm -hmm. That sunshine helps a lot with our uh, oh. dispositions, too. Yeah, I used that example on my family a few weeks ago. But when we were in Alaska a couple of years ago, um, it was in the summer. So it was still light out at midnight. <laughs> um, so there was very short hours of darkness there in the summer and as we were leaving i said to nancy i said you know this is kind of enjoyable but i don't think i could live here because in the winter months it's just the opposite there's mm -hmm. so much darkness i think i would get pretty depressed mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. being in darkness most of the day they must have a way to endure all of that i mean because a lot of people love alaskan living there so <laughs> <laughs> to each his own huh <laughs> That line kind of was reminding me of Pollyanna oh, in how a section um, <sighs> God and money. But there it says mammon was not just money, but to those material possessions that were deemed most valuable. So what are some of the material possessions that we face? in today's world that uh, would fall into this mammon category of <laughs> tendency to want to serve mammon, desire that more than desiring God and following God.
a lot of people think they have to keep up with their neighbor. The neighbor gets a new car. Oh, I got to get a bigger and a better one than that. And, you know, how many cars do you need? And how big a screens of TVs do you need? I hear refer to so many people, too, that, well, I got to get a better, you know, bigger screen <laughs> on that, that there's just so many material things out there that people just keep striving for. And we were driving the other day, and there are so many of these storage units now, every place. And I said to my husband, how can those all make a go of it? And he said, just look at all the people that have all the stuff they have, including us. We're kind of savers, too. We need to go through and get rid of a lot of stuff, too. But everybody's got these big outbuildings, and they just keep cramming stuff into and hoarders. And it, it's just, but it gets uh, to be a habit. I'm afraid a bad habit, too. We keep trying to get bigger and better and more. I always work on that. And I never succeed yet. I'm still. <laughs> yeah. It just keeps coming back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love it. All right, get more. <laughs> okay, there's a little spot. But the minute I give it away, I'm looking for it about two weeks later. It never fails. You know, I haven't used whatever for a long time. That has happened more than once. I'd say, I knew I shouldn't have got rid of that. <laughs> when my uh, parents were moving out of the house that they had lived in for 61 years, oh, wow. moving into a lower level of a house uh, not really an apartment but running for my aunt and as we were hauling stuff out my dad's going i don't know where i'm going to store all this stuff and i said dad you're 90 years old you need to store it you don't need it <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard to part with it's been a part of your life for a long time but then nancy and i were down there on sunday and my Dad's got macular de degeneration, and he finally met with his doctor, and she convinced him that he had to stop driving back in October. Uh, so he sold this car to one of our nephews. And they were going through a stack of papers to see if there was anything in there about the car that our nephew might want. Um, so it had, like, when you put tires on it. So... Um, and now those tires only got 4,000 miles on and stuff like that. He had every car he had ever owned <laughs> from the 1950 Chevy, the first vehicle he ever bought. The purchase information on it, the service records on it. He had notebooks of every time he filled up with gas. Oh, <laughs> wow. That mileage, would be interesting. What the mileage was, <laughs> how much gas it was, and what the price was. Yeah. And it's like, why? <laughs> <laughs> so well, Probably because he worked very hard with, to get the money to purchase it. You know, maybe just looking at from that, that I'm pretty proud of that yeah. I was able to get a car. That's true, too. Yeah. For sure, but now uh, he told me that I'll get on my bike. <laughs> so he was going through it, and uh, uh, there was a pile of stuff. Well, this can go in recycling, but he still kept the purchase receipt from every vehicle he ever bought. That, that's been yeah, that's, ours too. I think that's good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, getting back to you know feuding about keeping up with the neighbors. We've had mediations where the neighbors were just upset because they would. You know, hire somebody to do their lawn or they would take care of it, but the neighbors, theirs was an eyesore and they were complaining to the city and doing different things back and forth and back and forth. But it was amazing that some of those, they actually got together and said, I didn't realize, you know, it affected you that much. It's not as important to me as to you, but then one offers to help and get it up to speed, but it gets into disputes, not even just, you know, what hurt yourself but you know yeah. everybody else you should be this and you should do that and, yeah. it is important to get along with neighbors though and sometimes it's really yes. difficult because I that just bring to mind two years ago and talking about buildings my husband is kind of a car fanatic anyway so he put up a uh, nice big double garage and um he's into old cars too and redoing them and so on so um we built this garage and the neighbor next door we were like three houses down from the park at the end, which was beautiful. Okay, the neighbor closer to the park yet, I mean, had a beautiful view of the, of the park. Well, then where he put up, you know, my husband put this building up. If they looked the other way, which all it was was our yard to look that way, that neighbor was so, and maybe it was he was jealous that, you know, he didn't have a big garage or something. He never spoke to us again because it blocked his view. But like I said, he had this view the other way of the beautiful park. 
and this wasn't blocking his view, but he didn't like seeing that building there. But we okay. continued very hard to be nice. And my husband's always really stressed that you've got to get along with your neighbors. Yeah. And sometimes they can be so unreasonable, but you've just got to. It causes a lot of uh, problems. We just you painted on the side of the garage on the side, love your neighbor. Oh, <laughs> very. That would, that would have been even his. Oh, but that's bad. Yeah. I mean, it had darts on the side of the garage. <laughs> <laughs> but just hearing them say I'm sorry because they didn't really know what was behind everything but to get it out and talk about it yeah yeah but, um, that was a good ending on some of them some of them continued but I think just having them talk maybe I'd encourage them to talk you know once mm -hmm. they left us and they didn't come mm -hmm. together with any resolution but the old Hatfields and McCoys <laughs> <laughs> yeah can you hear me now dad hello so the that, actual passage where it says no one can serve two masters, um, we kind of look at, well, who wants a master? You think right away, master and slave. But as the commentary says here, um, to desire God, which makes God's one master, is to accept the reign of God. To desire God is to desire the source of all life, all goodness, all that could possibly be called treasure. So you should desire spiritual and uh, revelation, I guess, as opposed to just letting material things get in the way. Mm -hmm. So that moves into the next part about dependence on God. And On page 64 in that second uh, column. How did Jesus and his disciples survive? For the most part, they depend on support from other followers, chiefly, and maybe surprisingly, the women who accompany them. So let's look at those passages where it talks about the women. So Matthew 27, 25. Um, I can. Uh, there were many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Zebedee. Somebody keeps getting put it off here for some reason. <laughs> okay. And then Mark 15, 40 to 41. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of younger James, and of Joseph, and Salome. Uh, these women had followed him when he was in Galilee and ministered to him. There were also many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. <clears throat> and then Luke 8, 1-3. Yeah. Afterward, he journeyed from one town and village to another, preaching and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Accompanying him were the twelve and some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene from whom seven demons had gone out, 
Joanna, the wife of Harriet Stewart Chus Chusa, uh, Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. So what do you make of that where Jesus gives up his occupation to go about ministry he as um, Peter and Andrew, James and John abandoning their fishing, uh, Matthew abandoning his tax table to, to follow him. So they're giving up their occupations following Jesus. But here we have these women at a time that women were looked down upon. Um, women were still considered possessions of their father or of their husband. So on the three synoptic gospels, we've got Jesus' disciples being ministered to and cared for and their needs being met by women. Still happens today. <laughs> That's right. Behind every successful man or something like that is there's a good woman. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because there's there's got to be a source of income. I mean, they needed physical support. I mean, food, shelter, that type of thing. Um, they were busy preaching and not making the income that the women, you know, their efforts, their labors supported that. Um, kind of makes you wonder what, what they were doing to be able to do that. Yeah, where did their money come from? But yet they were being, I mean, they realized that Jesus and his followers were really special people. And so they were very generous then in uh, helping them uh, make a go of it, uh, what they needed with food and so on. The one thing about Catholic religion is that it honors, it honors and worships Mary, and you know, I don't think that. Yeah. Yeah, the role of the woman that's in this in this in this situation. I mean, it's uh, it, it's an enabler. Without it. Probably couldn't have happened that way they did. And the support of marriage and always being together, it's like a bond yeah. that they do both together as one to to continue to help. Yeah. It's kind of I mean, I've, I've never really thought about it that much. You know, I've read the passages, but you know, to give it the, some real thought, it's like um, you know. They're not given enough credit. They get there's a mention of it. That's you know that says hey, hey they supported them. You know and on and on about the rest of it. I, I, the rest of it's very important. But you know uh, the apostles get all the credit. Mm -hmm. Those first two passages you look at in, in Matthew and Mark. Where did those passages take place? Where, where were the women as we read those? Were they following or were they in the kitchen? You still can't hear me. <sighs> what was the mark on? 1540 to 41. I can look it up again. <laughs> Were they in the towns that they were traveling through, or were these women actually traveling with them? It's not real explicit. Well, in, in Luke, Luke, they were traveling with them, but Matthew yep. and Mark uh -huh. was a very specific spot they were at in those passages we read. 
that they followed him in, when he was in Galilee and uh, they came up with him in Jerusalem, to Jerusalem. Look a little deeper. <laughs> deeper? What was the passage in Matthew to give it more depth? Twenty-seven, fifty-five. Twenty-five, fifty-five, and fifty-six. <clears throat> well, that was. They were with him all the way through the crucifixion. Yeah, so in Matthew and Mark, the women were there at the crucifixion. Oh, okay. Where were the disciples? Yeah, okay. They were in town. They were the ones that abandoned him. So these women who met his physical needs as far as food and things during his ministry were the only ones that stayed with him during his passion and death, meeting his needs to the very end. Well, that's right. There was all those women along the line, too, when he was carrying the cross, too, that he told them to. Well, they were... Um, <clears throat> I think the term that some scripture scholars use were professional mourners. Oh, really? Well, yeah. So oh, that it was interesting. It was uh, where they were paid to go out and as somebody was being uh, let off to be crucified, which was a common form of uh, capital punishment for the Romans. And so they were out there doing their duty as paid mourners. Paid? That's why he tells them to worry about their families, yeah. not him. Yeah. Ah, uh -huh. interesting. <laughs> Imagine the Pharisees and so on use that against Jesus too when they talked about him eating with sinners and and uh, tax collectors and so on too. And all of a sudden he's got these women also that are following him. Long as you know, women yeah. weren't thought so highly of in those days. Then we get into judging others. And in that um, first column on page 67, where it talks about when cinnamon for, ju cinnamon for judgment is discernment. How did you get out of that commentary there about discernment? I thought it was interesting, you know, the, the idea of knowing that somebody did something wrong and being aware that it that behavior is wrong without actually judging that person for doing that. That judgment will come later. It just it, it seemed to, to take some of that onus away of you know you did something wrong you shouldn't be doing that you know that that, that puts that uh, back on you as a it's someone is judging them at that point You'd still be aware that not appropriate i had a lot of problems with a lot of things. 
with the light. <laughs> a lot of these, you know, the judging and the light and the... Yeah, and I had thought of too about our law in our day and age. Mm -hmm. And I hear commentaries and lawyers arguing this and that, you know, to not judge and whatever. And you have a horrific events, but people are entitled to free and um and not be judged and stuff like that too. It's um, you know, but looking into you look at a person. Some people can even judge by looking at somebody, which is so wrong. Um or they disagree with their viewpoint and whatever, which is what we do in our day and age politics and everything else. But having a good eye to look beyond what is, you know, what really to look at other than all of that. Because um, the discernment, I had to really read through that one a little bit on that. Um, Therefore, you are without excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for by the standard by which you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the very same thing. So discernment would be different than judging, right? Well, that's what this paragraph is mm -hmm. discussing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Because with discernment, you're stopping and thinking. You still can't hear me. Principles can be in situation. I don't know. Discernment is not the same as judging the person. Mm -hmm. The mic is not working. Only with the description, and the, I wish we had a um, uh, dictionary. <laughs> so, the description of discernment it might be interesting. I can Because I agree with you. I think that's very confusing. Trying to keep that straight, the discernment from the judging. I think the difference is discernment. In this case, they're talking about being aware of the quality of the action. Mm -hmm. you know, okay, yeah. The yeah. behavior. The behavior is inappropriate. The action is inappropriate. But try not to judge. Try not to judge the individual because you don't know where they've been, how they got to that point. That's very true. Yeah. What really drove that you know, yeah, to happen? If you yeah. start judging that, uh, let's say if you judge that person, well, then you're just putting yourself out there too. So that's how I looked at it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And definitely Jesus was that way with that when he was with, you know, the sinners and tax collectors and you know, many other people too, that uh, they were judging big time, you know, that he had to really be, but he's not. He's a very forgiving, loving person and continues and continues to show that, but it doesn't sink in, which we're saying too, it's hard to accept too. Sometimes you want to jump in and judge somebody right away, but you got to look at, yeah, what's really behind it all and what caused it. Mm -hmm. okay. Two sides to every story, aren't there? Yeah. <laughs> and, and the good to them, to the common people were, you know, what you should be doing and this and that. But why is he with this class of people that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that was... It was a good, but I had to read that a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of sections in here I read twice or three times. And again, almost get new glass. <laughs> oh, there in the bottom of page 67, it gets into what you just talked about. Jesus had something to offer sinners love, acceptance, and forgiveness. He had nothing to offer those who already counted themselves among the righteous. Mm -hmm. And the righteous, I suppose, could be considered too. Maybe those that were really reading the or going according to the Ten Commandments. But you know, there is a little leeway there too, with being loving and forgiving and so on. When somebody, you know, rather than thou shalt not and thou shall and so on too, you have to look into it more again. But like they said, Jesus had yeah the love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Yeah. That's a lot to offer. <clears throat> and the last part of that commentary there on page 68, that covenant was embodied in the law that Jesus came to fulfill. And one of the ways he fulfilled it was to extend God's love to those whom the righteous condemned as sinners. So who are ones that the righteous in today's society are condemning as sinners. 
being judging. Well, politics on both sides, <laughs> you know. repeat the question dad i was going to say viking fans but they <laughs> they, they really are sinners <laughs> <laughs> now who's judging <laughs> and what does that open you up to <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh and everybody goes by what the law is but then there was a law they had the commandments but it they knew of them but don't act on them and didn't really know a little bit more about um, what went with them. Um, but this day and age, I hear so many people arguing, no, it's this, no, it's that, and whatever. They have great arguments. Yeah, I always wanted to be on a jury, but uh, today, I mean, I never got called. Today, do <laughs> it would be very difficult. Yes. That's right. Even trying to get on there, I heard uh, some uh, oh, to, oh, to talk to radio show about people who get called and how some really want to, you know, and is that a red flag for, you know, the defendant and uh, prosecutor, or whatever, and how they go about doing that. And I heard a lot of people that have shared some of the insight into serving there. And do they get a fair, do they get a fair trial? I mean, and it only takes one person, you know, that says, nope, I don't want to agree. And where does it leave everything? Well, that's where attorneys, as they are questioning uh, prospective jurors, mm -hmm. get into what somebody's attitude is. And uh, you uh, have such a mindset that you're not going to approach this with an open mind. You've already got your mind made up about people who are like this defendant mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and those are always dismissed well racism is a it's a big issue and just judging people on how they look not who they are mm -hmm. it's a been a tough one to deal with you know, I, I grew up with biases built into me. I mean, it, you, know, I mean uh, you have to work with that to understand it. You know, that, oh, oh, yeah, I got to really think about this because, you know, my initial reaction, which comes from somewhere internally, it's like, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I grew up in North Minneapolis, and my husband and I had many Black friends, and um, but when they had... Um, uh, the uh, the riots and different things going on in North Minneapolis, it, the divide just happened, and that was so sad. Mm -hmm. We go to reunions now, and we see these people, you know, and we talk to them, and but it's never brought up or anything. And I almost wish it was just what happened there, you know, just to understand it better more. Mm -hmm. You can actually go. But yeah, to... you're right, and it is still there clearly. And it's many good people on both sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, the Marines, it was, uh, we were green on the outside, red on the inside. Mm -hmm. It's all that mattered. Yeah, there was a phrase in here somewhere, too, about a veteran or somebody in the military. I can't remember where that was. I kind of found interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can find that. One of the uh, terms that we heard frequently when we were up in Detroit Lakes, because the White Indian Reservation is just north in there, is what we refer to as Indians. Red on the outside, but white on the inside. So they're not mm. real Indians. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. But there are many nationalities, you know, like. Asians that you know they're 
all Asian, but they're definitely classes from Indiana. So, wow. even when the churches started bringing in the monks and stuff like that, um, yeah, there was even divided amongst that that group, you know. Um, my husband couldn't figure that out. He worked with many that were very hard workers, but he always would then compare and judge to those who weren't hard workers. And I said, you don't know, <laughs> which caused another conflict in our household a little bit, just to get a better understanding of it. And, he, and I wasn't working with these people like he was, and he was supervising and was trying to get everything rolling on the assembly line. And I said, I, I get that, yeah. but what do you do? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Treat with the respect they deserve. Is that you would want to be respectful? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, conflict has never changed, has it really? I mean, all the way back to um, Jesus' day, it just continues on. Well, well, now it's virtual, though. Oh, that's, yeah, that's true, too. I mean, you know, there's a difference uh -huh. in looking someone in the eye and saying, I, I don't like you or whatever, I disagree, whatever. But to, and the way I, I don't get involved. I don't do Facebook. I don't. Right. No, we don't either. Yeah. I mean, right away. I, I know. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of value to it, hmm. but it's a tool and it's being misused. Yeah, misused. Yes. Yeah. And that's what, and, and I just won't, I, personally, I you know, stay out of it. But you like it when I show you pictures. I'd like when you show me pictures. Yeah, yeah. good things. Yeah. Good good things. That's how wedding That's announcements are coming through. Yeah. <laughs> but even I didn't know I didn't get a wedding invitation, and my kid says, "Well, it's on Facebook." Mm -hmm. I don't do Facebook all the time to know mm -hmm. that, and it's like, oh, I don't get this. <laughs> yeah. But there's so many hateful things that are being said yeah. too, the, and especially yeah. the young people. I mean, I can see why they're having all the problems they are with all the things that they read and is sinking into them and they're acting the wrong ways on it. And, oh. But when you talk about visual, um, I've done Zoom, but I don't like doing Zoom. It's so much more effective and better for the parties to be face to face in person. Yeah, if you can. Alone for them to, but it's not the same. No. Not the same. Well, I think we want to have the volume set right here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Did you mute them? <laughs> or are you judging them? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think I said that. Okay, he's got two strikes going. He got the bike. Well, with you guys, well, we have been chatting. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear? Uh, good about adding. Hang on, we're working on it. <laughs> okay, can you Cindy's hear me now? Been trying. She's trying. Microphone not on yet. I had trouble with my Zoom. Oh my goodness. And I had been sick, but now I can be in person. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. So Linda could hear me. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. No, no I can't. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. I didn't have the speaker set to the TV. So, <laughs> thing in my uh, laptop that. Well, we can't hear Linda there. yet. Oh, she's. Yeah, I, that's because I've got myself muted uh, and just on mute when I talk because uh, my dog keeps barking here for some reason I don't want to <laughs> she wants <laughs> input <laughs> so I am also not, not catching that uh, I didn't switch the speaker because usually it does that automatically so I don't even think about it yeah that was oh. oh, yeah Cindy's <laughs> been trying to ask some questions Oh, no. oh. <laughs> I've tried to share multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> we were wondering if we weren't hearing you. <laughs> hearing from you. Okay. Yeah, they're usually very good about adding to the conversations. <laughs> we're sorry. We're sorry. We've been picking on the uh, deacon here, though, too. He said something about the Vikings that didn't go over real well. <laughs> oh, I liked the comment back, though, about... Uh, what does that mean now if you're about him being judgmental? I, I appreciated that comment. <laughs> you're not judgmental when you're stating facts. <laughs> no, that's not. <laughs> oh, that's that's funny one. 
Uh, which yeah. which alternate facts are you using? <laughs> <laughs> Just the truth. Oh, oh, oh. The alternate um, truth. <laughs> but on the judgment comments, um, oh. there are two different groups that I have seen um, or have heard people being judgmental about. Um, one, I oftentimes actually hear people being judgmental about evangelists, especially the like tele-evangelists and how they are being so judgmental. Um, and that kind of goes both ways. Um, how a lot of people are like, okay, those are the ones that are being, the tele televangelists are the righteous that are earning their reward here. Um, and I've heard some people, you know, viewing it from that way. Um, I've also have heard other parties that have been judgmental towards the queer or the LGBTQ plus community um, who they just see them in one direction and don't necessarily see them as people or as families that are full of love. They just see, oh, no, they're different. They have a different lifestyle and that's wrong. Um, so those are two communities or two different things that I have seen some different judgmental stuff on. Cindy, I don't remember if it was you or Heidi, um, but the course, man's religion or whatever it was called. Yeah, were, man's religious experiences with Turnwall. Uh, yeah, so where you had to go with a friend to their church of a different denomination. Yeah. Church that was just north of KDLM. Um, one of you went there with a friend, and as the minister was giving his sermon, and this was back when Clinton was president, um, said in his sermon that you know President Clinton was going to be going to hell. Right in this sermon. That um, would have probably been Heidi. I went to the Mennonite church and I had lots of other fun, interesting revelations at that one. <laughs> I was thinking it was Heidi, but then I was thinking, okay, he didn't become president until 92. Right. Yeah. Well, so, but she, she took that her last year of call, of high school. So that would have been correct then. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's a real danger that we have. Uh, my father-in-law always referred to it as the power of the pulpit. Uh -huh. <laughs> But he, he did that when he was using his family as an example, and they would say, hey, well, well, that's not right. Well, I could uh, work with the, the real facts a little bit to help make the point I'm trying to make. But uh, then you call that the power of the pulpit. But that, that's a real danger. Um, mm -hmm. where we've got a captive audience, and we're up there, and we start saying things that we're bringing our own judgmental attitudes into something. I mean, I could joke when you say here that Viking fans are sinners, but if I said, <laughs> oh, can laugh about it. I, yeah. I'd probably get excommunicated. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll support you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not encourage it. <laughs> no, just being honest. <laughs> but that's one of the things that. Um, for our tax exemption as churches, we're not supposed to get involved in politics as far as favoring or opposing a candidate. We can do something on issues. Um, so, I mean, that's why we talk about the life issues so much. Mm -hmm. That's very much part of our church teaching, not just abortion, but all the life issues. And that's where y'all run into some conflict with people who, uh, in fact, uh, Bishop Balky and I um, kind of had a cutting of our ways with MCCL when um, they call themselves Minnesota Citizens Concerned for Life. But they um, came out in support of um, Rodriguez, I can't remember what his first name was, who had kidnapped a female in North Dakota and brought her into Minnesota and 
raped and killed her here, which made it a federal crime since it crossed state lines, because neither North Dakota or Minnesota have capital punishment. Federal crimes do. Um, and Polenti had come out in favor, Mr. Polenti was governor, he'd come out in favor of the um, federal government pursuing capital punishment for this guy. And Balk and I contacted MCCL and said, you know, you keep referring to pro-life Governor Polenti. He's in favor of capital punishment. Please stop calling him pro-life. But we don't take a stand on capital punishment because we have members who are on both sides of that issue. Well, then call yourself Minnesota Citizens Concerned for Abortion. Then abortion is your only life issue. Um, and that's where the Catholic Church has what they call the consistent ethic of life, um, where it's respecting all life from conception to natural death. Capital punishment is not natural death. Um, and that's why the catechism of the Catholic Church has been changed twice to where now it totally condemns capital punishment. Right? This next section where it says, both dogs and swine were considered to be unclean animals by first and first century Jews. And then here Jesus uses these animals as contemptuous terms in reference to Gentiles. So he's saying things to where he's basically speaking against Gentiles, where in his final um, commissioning of the disciples just before he ascends to heaven is um, go therefore make disciples of all nations. So kind of a change from ignoring the Gentiles to now going and preaching to them and baptizing them. So what do you make of that change there from uh, Jesus' original preaching equating dogs and swine, the unclean animals, uh, as Gentiles, and then in the end saying, we'll make disciples of all nations. <clears throat> Was he really referring specifically to Gentiles or, or for the people he considered that were not righteous? Uh, you know, I was, I was kind of curious on that. It just seems that uh, someone can be a dog or a swine, even if they're not Gentile. Or tax collector. <laughs> well, the um, <clears throat> passage that uses down there, yeah. It is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. When he's talking to a Canaanite woman who's asking for her daughter to be healed, a little demon that possesses her. But then he did it anyway. The what? He didn't need to. Well, her. yeah, because then the woman comes back with, well, even the dogs eat the crumbs. From the, from the table, and then she says, okay, your, your face is strong, so yeah, daughter's demon is driven out. Yeah, because that's what it's, it's not, it's not the fact that it's a Gentile per se, it's the, it's the amount of faith that a person has, and then and their intent, what do they intend to do with their life? But he never refers to what he's getting into arguments with yeah. Pharisees and scribes. He refers to them as hypocrites, not as dogs. Yeah, well, it's true. Okay. I had trouble with that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because he taught all along that you know, God loved people. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you have to transition for the apostles. Because um, what I was kind of thinking is they oftentimes say you have to take care of stuff at home first before you can deal with stuff outside or like where it's got the take care of the beam in your own eye before you can remove the um, splinter from your brother's eye. Well, so he has to, so Jesus needs to make sure that he's taking care of his own people first, that they are understanding and that he is bringing the word to them and God's love and commandments to them first. Once they've got it, then they can go out to the other nations. So he's taking care of at home first before going out. All I got is questions. <laughs> <laughs> and, and good questions, interesting questions to get more thought into it too. <laughs> and the next section on prayer and a little um, section there from the catechism where it talks about the different types of prayer, but it highlights petitionary prayer. In the Mass, we have our general intercessions, which are all petitions, things that we're asking for. Um, so what do you make of petitionary prayer as one of the forms of prayer? Wouldn't that be the same as saying, uh, you know, the power of prayer? I, you know, as in numbers? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> For me, it's the most common type. Yeah, I mean, There are so many things out there that we need to pray for, too. So I think it's just great that we are able to do that yeah. for people to bring up these different uh, petitions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That you might not even think of until you hear somebody else ask about it in the petition. Yeah. And it all needs prayer. Yeah, and the power of prayer, I definitely believe in that. It really is wonderful. And not only for what we want and need for others. Yes, no, yeah, for the whole world. Yeah, and that's why we need, need to keep to praying. Everybody does every single day. Now, when I pray for the enemy, person that they don't particularly care for, I think they, you know, they could use some help. Uh, it's not a prayer of thankfulness per se. It's just the it's, petition asking that they see the light. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think by us praying for our enemies too gives us that light too. I mean, mm. yeah, yeah, that's true too. You get that feeling of something's been lifted from you. Yeah, we're trying at least. They might not change ever, but we got to keep trying. Persistence. Most of the time, our <clears throat> general intercessions on weekend masses have a time of silence where you can just uh, mm -hmm. say prayers to yourself that you're asking for. And mm -hmm. Whenever we have that, I've got different ones that I, I use quite regularly. Um, some might change depending on what's going on, but I always end with the same one. God, heal our broken nation. Well, yeah, isn't that important? Wow. Not God bless the bus. That was what Troy would always add at the end of the intercessions was God bless the bus. <laughs> For the school bus. <laughs> oh, I was wondering what bus. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> then we get into the golden rule that um, I like to quote frequently um, do unto others before they can do unto you. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> That's the Marine Corps model. <laughs> <laughs> As it says over there on the bottom of page 69, both the golden rule and the love commands demonstrate the priority Jesus gives to relationships as the context for obedience to the law. And the bottom there, because it is stated as a positive command, do to others, rather than a negative command, don't do to others. The golden rule implies an active stance towards all others. So it's actually calling us to action, right? So it's actually because of the golden rule and that line that we were, were discussing at the beginning of the session, the love thy neighbors, um, that I ended up with one of, the, one of my best friends because in junior high, I had a classmate that we were very competitive and constantly arguing and at each other's throats. He used to say that he despised me. Didn't hate me, it was despised me. It was very clear that it was despised, not hate. <laughs> and then in ninth grade, something just kind of altered in me. And I was like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna take the gospel to heart. We're gonna do this. And so I just kind of started changing my interactions with him. And come high school, we were best friends. He was one of my best friends still is. I found this little card to it was stuck in my Bible. I don't know where I got it from, but anyway, it says kindness matters. One kind word can change someone's entire day. Open a door for someone. Let someone in front of you in traffic. Say please and thank you. Just be nice. It takes no effort. Who knows? It may even become contagious. And then on the bottom, it says drop or place one of these cards where someone will find it. So I thought that, and then on the back too, thank a veteran, ask for um, help, uh, be grateful. It goes on and on. And is that not exactly what the golden rule is to just really, you know, stop. And and I love it, Deacon, you had said one time when I was talking about somebody uh, giving the finger in traffic and you said, just give them a blessing back. You <laughs> learned <laughs> that hand, you never know what they're thinking. You're doing. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, we just yeah got to remember just to be kind. Yeah, bite your tongue sometimes and mm -hmm. say something kind rather than the nasty thing that really went through your mind to say or do. We're not perfect. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, it kind of summarizes the whole sermon. The golden rule. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's, yeah there's it really does. Two points, you know. Love your neighbor, love God. Yeah, you got the commandments, the beatitudes, you know, mm -hmm. spiritual. I mean, they all combined. Yeah. And it's good to really understand more and get in deeper into what the mean, true meaning is. I don't know to act and do. <clears throat> then gets into false prophets. About on page seven, there true prophets recognize that the fruit of tomorrow is planted in the seeds of today, and that the judgment of tomorrow lies in the behavior choices of today. So, what are some ways of being a true prophet? Live in the here and now instead of being like, oh, I'll give to charity the next day or whatever. When you see something today that you can make a difference, do it today, not wait for another opportunity. I think true prophet uh, is um, someone who uh, their acts are for others and not just themselves.
Then on the next page, false prophets only seek their own welfare, their own glory. They are intent on gaining a following for themselves, often by taking sheep away from the rest of the flock. Unity has always been a hallmark of discipleship. <laughs> so what are some false prophets that we see in today's society? Someone who's selfish. Mm -hmm. They use others to get ahead in life instead of using you know, uh, as uh, what we already went over is uh, instead of depending on God, they depend on other people for their gains in life. I think of a prophet as being someone that's focused on religion, but there are people that behave in a way that you know they, they gather people to themselves for other purposes. And, uh, and you see a lot of time in politics. And you wonder, oh, does this person really believe in what they're saying, or they just want the power? I, I don't I don't see it. Too I think much. in a lot of cases they just want the power. You think? <laughs> so oh, where yeah. does Unity try to come into it. <laughs> well, I hear talks about unifying the Christian religion again. And there's there's a desire to do that. Uh, I don't know if all Christian sects have that same desire. So I don't know if that's. Well, I remember Father Paul, was it last week or the week before, talking about it's okay. And he, and he himself goes to Northgate, I mean, in the community, getting heads together and, and meeting and talking. Yeah. That's right. They are Christians. We're all <laughs> Christians. And to do that, it's never heard of that back when. Uh, it was, um, we don't really have a strong ministerial association here. We had a very strong one in Detroit Lakes and also up in Pauley. Uh, so two of the parishes that I served in, we did a joint uh, mission trip with uh, Food for the Poor of those two ministerial associations. So people of different denominations. Uh, originally, we were supposed to go to Haiti, but just before we were supposed to go is when they had a coup down there and they were telling all Americans to leave Haiti. Mm -hmm. So we ended up mm -hmm. going to Jamaica instead. Um, but what we did in uh, Holly is on Good Friday, we um, would pray the Stations of the Cross in the streets so we would start at one of the churches and pray the stations of the cross even though most um, other christian denominations don't use the stations of the cross but there, there they did um and end up at another church and then we would have a joint good friday service of the seven last words um so Different people would be preaching different years using those seven last words of, of Jesus that are here in the various crucifixion stories. Um, so there were some real examples of unity in a very uh, important time in Christian faith and Good Friday. We did something similar in Lake Park, but there was this a Catholic church, a Lutheran church there. So it's just the two of us going back and forth, alternating who held the joint service. Um, and there's dialogue that the uh, Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, has with various denominations. This trying to focus on what do we hold in common? Um, what are the things that we uh, jointly believe? And what things can we do together? So there's work towards unity <clears throat> without necessarily uh, coming together as one denomination, but. 
Mm. Yeah, that would be wonderful if more of that could happen, more of the different religions, yeah. And, you know, you might agree to disagree on a few things, too, but still showing <laughs> unity. And you certainly had to have unity in your family with your father-in-law being a, uh, what would you say, Presbyterian minister? No, he's he Methodist. Methodist. Okay. Um, yeah. Nancy's different... still Methodist. <laughs> yeah. um, I think there's seven different religions we have when we gather as a family around the table. Oh, oh wow. At so, least uh, seven. Uh, <laughs> one of Nancy's brothers is Mennonite. Um, the other brother is still Methodist, but his wife is Jewish. Um, Nancy's still Methodist. Um, let's see, we've got a couple son-in-laws that are Lutherans. Um, one of her sisters is in a town that doesn't have a Methodist church, so she goes to her Presbyterian church. And um, her brother that's uh, Mennonite. <clears throat> um, both his mother-in-law and father-in-law were congregational ministers. Well, well that's, that's interesting. really interesting. Yeah. So we have our own <clears throat> ministerial association. We do family. Right, yes. That's <laughs> about ecumenical that medical family. That's part the unity there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, My... when I'm dating Nancy, um, we got into different discussions on religion and um, Nancy's older sister would always you know, try to one-up me and she said, yeah, there's one more for the Christians uh, right against the lions. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. Oh. Yeah. My brother-in-law is currently in seminary to become a Lutheran minister. Um, and when he was just starting the seminary, he was really intrigued at the um, trying to find reconciliation between the Lutherans and the Catholics. And so he's mm -hmm. actually been doing quite a bit um, in the community that he's currently stationed in, in trying to build ministry between all of the different denominations in that small town. He's now in a small town in Iowa um, where he was doing um, I forget what the actual term is, but essentially like a residency um, where he's at right now. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Good. He's yeah. very young, very ambitious, but uh, he's going to do a lot of good. <laughs> yep. Mm. Now, the Lutheran Seminary, they, it's a four-year seminary program, but they have two years of classes and a year that they are out working in a congregation and then back for the fourth year of classes. I was going to share, I actually went to a woman's retreat, wasn't, uh, I, I actually was Northgate, and it was remarkable. Um, all of us women, you know, we all had our different Bibles, but the discussion was, you know, different segments of it. We did crafting and stuff, we did, it was amazing, and it was so foreign to me when I was first asked, but I thought, I'm going, I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> I went, and um, yeah, I haven't seen any, but I, I always look for them because I know they have some locally and through the Catholic uh, spirit. I think the bulletin, that, you know, they have different things that you can, can do, but that was a long weekend and it was remarkable. Mm. It was really amazing. It's like everything <laughs> Well, let's <clears throat> move into some of the questions for this week. Question two, what things tend to worry you the most? Are these worries connected to certain perceived needs in your life? How can you develop more trust in God's care? Well, one of the things that worries me the most is how many more days am I going to be able to continue to go up and down the stairs in my house? Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, keep praying to God every day. And so far, he's been helping me through. Uh, he's helped me have an amazing support group and get lots of things in place so that bad days we can make life work. Mm -hmm. 
I've been uh, undergoing, I call it a battle, but going through these readings has helped me to really take a pause on things. Um, I drove many miles to Minnetonka for my doctor appointment and a power or a tree branch knocked out the transformer so they couldn't get my data from my diabetes to meet with me. So they said there'll be no copay. Well, a month later, I get a bill for $20 for a copay for a visit I never had. And I thought, okay, well, I called and I thought it'd be taken care of. And they said, they'll take care of it. I got a second one. And they acknowledged that it was resubmitted, but it was denied. You still owe 20 bucks. I said, so I drove six, how many, 60 miles round trip or whatever. And I said, I never had the appointment. Hmm. I took another pause and I called the clinic back. And then I had two prescriptions that were denied brand new with an asthma issue that I've had. And it's like, okay, I had that. I've learned to take pauses that, do I pay the 20? Do I even worry about the medicine? I mean, this has been good for me because it's what it's done to me, what anger can do and everything and the stress that creates another problem for me. Um, and I tend to have people call me with their issues. I have one recently and I take a pause and I says, well, you know, I can only just see what I can recommend you call to find out about it. Um, but I got so frazzled by that. Uh, my blood pressure went up. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how can it creates another problem for me? <laughs> and it's like, why me? But people have worse problems is all I could come up with, you know? <laughs> um, but I had... Um, uh, I have leadership on that one to get me through it. I was praying that lift this off of me, help me deal with this. It's not even that big of a deal compared to most people right now. Um, but if I didn't have that guidance, I wouldn't. So I still don't know what to do about it, but we're praying for it. It's praying, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Be interesting. And tonight's session when my dad is on because he worries about everything. And there's not something he's worried about. It's okay. There must be something I'm missing that I should be worried about. <laughs> and so and his mother mother was the same way. It's like if there's a tornado watch, he'd be out the front porch just staring at the sky. And it's like well, the tornado comes, we just go down to the basement. It's not going to help me to sit out here and worry about it and watch the sky. But, so I think we were in Wisconsin Dells. I saw this plaque that I bought that I had in my room as a kid. There's nothing to worry about. Either you're going to stay well or you're going to be sick. If you stay well, there's nothing to worry about. If you get sick, there's only two things to worry about. You're going to get better, you're going to get worse. If you get better, there's nothing to worry about. If you get worse, only two things to worry about. You're going to live or you're going to die. If you're going to live, there's nothing to worry about. If you're going to die, there's only two things to worry about. Uh, you're going to go to heaven, there's nothing to worry about. Or you're going to go to hell and you'll be so busy shaking hands with all your old friends, you won't have time to worry about. Oh, goodness. Uh, that day that I drove 60 miles, it was we were alerted. It was a severe weather. Oh. And, on top but I could not see my doctor for another three months if I didn't show up. So I told my husband, get the truck going, and he got the tire, ear in the tire. And I drove through the worst weather and then oh. get there, and the power was up. Oh. And it's like, things still could have been worse. But now <laughs> I have <guess> another. <laughs> I had to raise your blood pressure all right and everything. Yeah, that's what I caught. And it's like, no, it's, it's not worth it. I'll deal with it, but whatever happens. And, Hey, we're a little bit over time here. So this is up to question 10. This is what I want to discuss. With <laughs> what challenges you most in Jesus' teaching from the Sermon on the Mount? Like I said, I have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I put down to what we talked about earlier was forgiving your enemy with all the things that are going on in the world and what's happening in Turkey and or Ukraine and uh, being brought to their knees, I'm sure, with everything going on. Um, but there's a lot of good, as you said, but I said before, too. But we got to concentrate on the good and not the bad. But that forgiving the enemy, yeah, that takes a lot of praying, a lot of praying. Yeah. Can I just share something with you guys? Sure. Um, we went to um, 
uh, St. Cecilia's Church last Saturday night. Our cousin belongs there, and she had mentioned to us that they have a gentleman there that's blind and reads like about once a month. And my husband said, gosh, would that ever be interesting to be a uh, part of that? And so she let us know that he was going to read last Saturday night. And so we went to the mass and it was just, it's a very small church. It reminded me, it's 125 years old, she was telling us too. And it's in a neighborhood. They That's don't my any- church. <laughs> is it really? Yeah. Oh my God. You know this gentleman I'm talking about. Justin, I'm sure- Justin is oh. fabulous. And I've had a um, couple of his kids in confirmation. Oh my gosh. What an unbelievable, I thought, what a true disciple. You know, when we were talking about here too, uh, a true disciple of Jesus with his uh, disability to get up there, and I guess from birth, he's been blind, to get up there, he has a seeing eye dog, mm-hmm. but to get up there and with his Braille Bible, this big white book he has up, opened up up there, and he it does, has dark glasses on, but just to watch him, well, and listen, of course, too, he didn't miss a beat, a word or anything. I thought, oh my gosh, you do much better than a lot of people that could see completely. I mean, we all goof up, but I mean, oh, it was just so mesmerizing watching his fingers go across that uh, Braille. And read that he did that and he did the prayers of the faithful then too. It was just fantastic. What is more amazing about him and his story is, yeah, he's been blind from birth, but one of his daughters is deaf and has Asperger's. So he can't always see what she is signing to him. And she, of course you know, can't hear what he says, but they have an amazing way of communicating and have a fabulous relationship. Oh, thank the Lord. Again, God's yeah, no, through. he and I have had amazing conversations. I love him and his wife are just fabulous. They've got a great family. Oh, I'll bet. That was just so interesting. I wanted to share that with you. And that's just really something that's your church. Uh, that's good. Well, one of the things is, um, that I had on the challenge was we have so many obstacles that prevent us from seeing and hearing with all the things going on in the world that it deters us from moving ahead and jumping in with things. And um, we want to try and study and learn goodness for ourselves to help teach others for that. But these obstacles are there that is, and being aware of those obstacles, getting that vision that these are things that are stopping us that we might have in our power to, you know, to deal with. Yeah. But those are the challenges is, you know, it, you just want to do good and be helpful and whatever, but day after day after day, but I'm shutting the TV off. I'm doing different things like that. I want my vision to stay focused on the most important thing. Jesus mm-hmm. Christ, it just, that's going to help. Yeah. <clears throat> Any final thoughts on anything from today's lesson or from any of the previous ones or any insights, questions, comments? There's a a paragraph here on 71 that I put a big question in my mind. The frightening aspect of this particular teaching is that it is possible to do great deeds in the name of Jesus, even deeds of healing, and still be sent away by Jesus when he finally establishes the kingdom once and for all. Some who claim to know Jesus will be told that Jesus never knew them. Can you explain that at all in real lay terms? Did it? Yeah, I read that over and over. I I mean, here we think we're doing good, but are we not doing the right good? That when we're going to get up there, all of a sudden he's going to deny us. You're going the other direction. And I don't want to shake hands with my friends that are down there. (laughs) Is it? you truly believe that you are um, doing this in the name of Jesus or are you using his name to great gain credibility? Oh, okay. Like we did talk earlier about the people that are out there doing things just for like the Pharisees that prayed on the outside and wanting everybody to see him, but not doing it for the right reason. Yeah. Okay. Um, So it falls into that false. So that's what it, ah. And so that can also be not necessarily the public, but even yourself. Mm, Sure. Well, yeah, definitely. You have to start with yourself first. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That is, that makes much more sense now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of looked at it. Looked at that one too? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I put a big question mark on that one. I thought I got to get that a little more thought through. Okay. Anything else? 
Well, the Sermon on the Mount was really interesting. I mean, all that it involved, you know, not just that one that, you know, we think that it's the only one, but yes. I have another just quick question about the reading today, if this will be okay, about sure. Moses. Did Moses really, how, Moses, Noah, Noah and the ark, how in the world, I mean, uh, I, this is kind of practical, I thought, how did he have enough food on that ark for 40 days and 40 nights for the people and all those animals? Now we just oh. got <laughs> provided. Everything wasn't flooded out, so DoorDash was still operating. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. And it was uh, delivery to the ark. <laughs> Door to DoorDash. Again, the Door story to DoorDash. Of Noah and the ark is a story. <laughs> okay, that there, did cross my mind. Separate from the Bible, um, at the time, um, there were a lot of flood stories that were being told. So floods were a way of getting across a message. Oh, so okay. The, in fact, there's two different sources that wrote part of the uh, story. What we heard today was um, take seven of the pairs of all the clean animals. Uh -huh. and, uh, in the end, what did Moses do? Or Noah do? He offered sacrifice. If he'd only taken two pair of each and he sacrificed the clean animals, there'd be no clean animals left. So there's one, the, the priestly source, which is what we heard today, because they're the ones that are into sacrifice, have him taking seven pair of clean animals uh, and just a single pair of the unclean animals. Mm -hmm. um, but the, I remember it's the Yahwist or Eloist source has this single pair of, of all animals. Um, so again, there's just conflicts there between the versions, but it, it's a story to show God's displeasure with people turning away from God and turning to sin. Uh, okay. And uh, it's a way of washing away sin and basically creation all over again. But again, it's a story to get across a religious truth, not a historical. Oh, fact. see, and I'm one of these gullible ones. I believe it right to the word. So when we get monsoon yeah. rains, this was rain for how old was was, <laughs> was Noah when the flood ended? Well, what the 600 years, 600 whatever. Yeah. I thought that too was that supposed to be saying he was 600 years old. See, I would have believed that. Well, God, it's really good to him. <laughs> well, that, maybe not good. Who wants to live to 600? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Is that reading so. it in faith? Than yeah, yeah, yeah. So longevity is a way because again, back at that time, there was no belief in eternal life, so everything was a reward or punishment in in this life. So a long life was a way of being rewarded. So when you hear these people hundreds of years old, it was just a way of saying they were a good person. Oh, so okay. Not, again, that would not. That would not. Yeah, yeah. That when your health school sweet so one lived to be. Okay, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for straightening that out throughout the readings and the Old Testament bringing Adam and Eve being brought. I mean, it samples of what is to be understood. What with that? I mean, it is so helpful. Um, yeah, a lot of stories, but some of the things I worried about was okay. Jesus said this, and now they're like you said. It's like this makes no sense. <laughs> you know, he. Uh, he is our leader, um, and he wasn't, you know, saying, no, that isn't the way it is, but, you know, the explanation of, you know, more to it to get believers and, you know, get your faith intact. Yeah, faith, yeah. faith, faith, faith. Yeah. Gotta have it, for sure. Well, thank you very much for going over time, too. I just... <laughs> yeah. Um, next Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, so it'll be Mass in the morning and in the evening, uh, 9 in the morning and 7 Wednesday night. Two weeks from today, we'll begin our Lenten Bible study. Um, we don't have very many people signed up yet. So, um, we you know, yeah. get to them. Yeah, so, um, there in Sam, you're saying that too. Linda, Cindy, you said you would not be able to do that because you got your act acupuncture scheduled. Yeah, because I'll be doing both acupuncture and pool therapy, and that's just too many things during the week, um, plus all my other appointments. So trying to fit this in is just going to take too much more energy than I have, unfortunately. So I will join you back next fall. <laughs> okay.
Okay. Yeah. It was nice yeah. having you. So yeah. I need to get books ordered. So Kathy, if you're going to participate and get a registration yep. turned in and yep. encourage others to sign up. Um, because we get the best price on the books. Yeah, I order at least 15, but if we don't have 15 participants, mm -hmm. then I didn't charge enough for it. I mean, <laughs> very subsidized as a them. So. And Randy, did you have that um, recorded for the third session? I didn't hear from you. I, I recorded it. I don't know if Troy uploaded it or not. Oh, okay. Okay. I just, I, when I was supposed to, but. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, closing prayer. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come. Thy thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliverance from evil. Amen. Amen. You know, when that I was is a collection, um, uh, a church type uh, wide one for uh, for the earthquake victims and so on. We not heard anything yet. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. They all so badly because like like usually it was after rain. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's the deaths up? Thirty. Forty. I thought. Yes. Okay. I even have to drive them. And then some